All right, let's jump into another deep dive. This time, we're heading straight into the Cold War, 1962 to be exact. We're going to check out a super secret project called Operation Fish BRL. Oh, this is a good one. Yeah, you gave me this formally classified Air Force document. Mm -hmm. And it lays everything out, all the goals, the experiments they were planning. The money. Even how much it was all going to cost. It's wild. I mean, talk about a window into a time when, well, let's be honest, the world was kind of freaking out. Yeah. And scientists were, well, they were trying to figure out what would happen if nukes went off way up high in the atmosphere. It's not just about, like, the kaboom, though, right? It's more about how people were thinking back then. Right. You got to picture it. The U.S., they're relying on radar systems to know if anything's coming at them. And then, boom, they realize a high-altitude nuclear blast could basically make those systems go blind. Yeah, like useless. Poof. That fear, that's the core of Operation Fish BRO. So they really needed to understand how these high altitude detonations would mess with all their systems, like radar and communications and everything. Yep. But before we get into all that, can we talk about just how high up we're talking here? Well, they blacked out the exact altitudes for the tests in this document. Of course they did. But what we do know is that they were really focused on these, what they called intermediate altitudes. Okay. And here's the thing. They thought each of these tests would have totally different effects. Mm. Because, you know, as you go up, the atmosphere things out. Right, right. So different altitudes mean different outcomes. So different altitudes, different effects. Well, Got it. But what actually happens during one of these high altitude nuclear explosions it can't just be a bigger bang, right? No, no, not at all. It's this crazy chain reaction. First, you have this fireball less than a kilometer across, but super hot, like millions of degrees, and it throws out energy incredibly fast. And then I'm guessing things get really weird. Oh, yeah. The air around the fireball, it just soaks up all that energy, heats up, and becomes part of the fireball itself. Yep. And that makes the whole thing expand like crazy. And now picture this. At certain altitudes, all the debris from the explosion suddenly gets stopped by the thicker atmosphere. Mm. They actually called it the pancake effect because it creates this flat, expanding disk of radioactive material. A radioactive pancake. Yeah. Okay, that was not on my Cold War bingo card. Yeah. But wait, there's more, right? <laughs> what about these conjugate points? All right, so this is where it gets even more bizarre. Remember those beta particles? They're like these tiny bits of energy that shoot out from the explosion. Oh. Well, they mess with Earth's magnetic field and cause ionization. But here's the kicker. It happens way far away from the actual blast, like way to the north. Really? Imagine a detonation near Johnston Island, you know, where they were planning some of these tests. Yeah. Well, the impact could be felt around Samoa. That's thousands of miles away. Hold on. So you're saying a nuke going off in one place could cause all sorts of chaos on the other side of the planet. Mm -hmm. How is that even possible? It's all because of Earth's magnetic field. Think of it like this. You got these magnetic field lines connecting opposite points on the globe, like invisible strings stretching from pole to pole. Okay. So those beta particles, they travel along these lines, and they cause all kinds of ruckus at the other end, things like radio and radar blackouts. It's like a global domino effect. Yes, my mind is officially blown. <laughs> this document also gets into the specifics about all the experiments they were planning. What were some of the most, I don't know, interesting ones? Well, the fireball blackout experiment is a pretty wild one. Okay. They wanted to use rockets and ground stations to measure exactly when the fireball became see-through to radio signals at different frequencies. See -through. Yeah, transparent. Basically, they were trying to like map out the blackout as it was happening. Remember, their biggest fear was those Soviet nukes creating these blackouts that would blind their defenses. They had to understand it. So that experiment was all about that fear of a Soviet attack. Yeah. What about all that radioactive debris? Were they tracking that too? Oh, absolutely. They had this thing called the gamma scanner experiment. Right. They were going to put these super focused gamma ray counters on rockets so they could map out exactly where all that, you know, radioactive pancake was spreading. Hmm. It's like they were trying to study every single angle of these high altitude explosions. Yeah, they were thinking of everything. They even planned a topside sounder experiment to figure out what was going on above the blast. Oh, baby. Yeah, they wanted to use rockets to check out the electron density in the upper layers of the ionosphere. You can't really study that area very well from the ground. And they knew the blast would mess with it. So they were looking at the effects close to the blast, way far away at these conjugate points, and even up above the blast. Wow, talk about thorough. They were. And speaking of thorough, this document also gets into all the nitty-gritty details about how they were going to pull off Operation Fishbowl. Let's hear it. 
It's fascinating. They talk about why they picked the Thor missile. They needed something reliable that could carry a heavy load, including those pods they wanted to eject right into the blast zone. Right into the blast. How close are we talking? Sometimes as close as a kilometer or two away. You're kidding. That's insane. Did they happen to mention how much this whole operation was going to set them back? It doesn't sound cheap. Oh, they were very upfront about the cost. The total estimate was almost $40 million. Wow. In 1961 <laughs> dollars, that's a lot of dough. What kind of timeline were they working with? Their aim was to be ready to go in just five months. Five months. That seems really fast for something this massive. It was, and that was assuming everything went perfectly, which, let's be real, it never does. Yeah, that's true. But it's amazing how much planning went into these tests. They did seem to take safety seriously, at least, right? Well, for sure. The report even has all these calculations about how much eye damage the detonations could cause, even if you were far away. I guess they were worried about people in Hawaii, since it's pretty close to the planned blast zone. Exactly. They had to think about that. But it does make you wonder, why were they in such a rush to do these tests? What was driving all this urgency? Well, to understand that, we need to zoom out a little and look at what was happening in the world back then. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the next part of our deep dive. Welcome back. So before we go any further with this Operation Fisher Below document, yeah, we really got to remember what was going on back then. 1962, Cold War, tensions are high. Right, like really high. The U.S. and the Soviet Union, they're locked in this like nuclear arms race always trying to one-up each other. It was a pretty intense time, wasn't it? I mean, everyone's living with the thought of nuclear war. It's hard to even imagine that. It really is. And you can feel that that fear and urgency all through this document. They weren't just messing around with science experiments. They were trying to understand this new, terrifying thing that could destroy everything. So how did Operation Fishbowl actually fit into all of that? Well, like we talked about, they were really worried about their radar and communication systems. Mm. Picture this. The Soviets launch a surprise attack, and the U.S. has no clue because their early warning systems are fried from a high-altitude detonation. Total disaster. That's a scary thought. <laughs> so these tests were as much about keeping the country safe as they were about science. Exactly. Yeah. They had to know what they were dealing with, both to defend themselves and, you know, maybe even go on the offensive. If the Soviets could use these high-altitude blasts to mess with American defenses, right. could the U.S. do the same to them? That's what they were trying to figure out. It's kind of crazy how the science and the strategy are all mixed up together in this document. Yeah. They're not just studying the explosions. They're trying to figure out how to use them or how to stop them from being used against them. Exactly. And remember that whole pancake effect we were talking about? The radioactive uh, pancake. Yeah. That wouldn't happen at lower altitudes. These high-altitude blasts were something totally new, uncharted territory. Each test at a different altitude was like opening a new page in the, you know, the nuclear playbook. And what about those beta particles and that whole conjugate point thing? The idea that a detonation could cause problems thousands of miles away is pretty intense. It really is. It just shows you how connected everything is on this planet and how easy it is to mess things up without even meaning to. Imagine trying to explain to people in Samoa that their radio went out because of a nuclear test near Johnston Island. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> it really makes you wonder if they really grasped how big of an impact what they were doing could have on the whole planet. Yeah, it's a question historians are still arguing about. Did they really understand the long-term consequences, or were they so caught up in the Cold War that they just weren't thinking that far ahead? This document also mentions specific systems that they were worried about, like... BMUWS and Nike Zeus. Those were the ones designed to intercept incoming missiles, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Missile defense is definitely a big deal, but they also talk about ICBM penetration. What's that? Basically, figuring out ways to get your missiles past enemy defenses, sneaking them through. So they were thinking about both sides of the coin, how to defend against a nuclear attack and how to potentially launch one. Exactly. The document even suggests that high altitude blasts could create like a blind spot in enemy radar so American missiles could fly through undetected. It's like a cat and mouse game with incredibly high stakes. Yeah, it was a race, not just in terms of politics, but also technology. But beyond all the science and strategy talk, mm -hmm. you can still see the human side in this document too. Like all those calculations about eye damage. Oh yeah, for sure. They knew the whole world was watching and any mistake, any accident could be a huge disaster. Not just physical damage, but political fallout, too. It's a big deal. I can't even imagine the pressure they must have been under. 
try to put yourself in their shoes. You're a scientist or an engineer, and you're dealing with this crazy, powerful force. Try and understand it, and knowing that one wrong move could end everything. Intense. Seriously intense. And we're just seeing a tiny part of what was going on back then. It's just one piece of a huge story. Right. It's like a clue that helps us see the bigger picture of the Cold War and how it affected everyone, not just countries, but regular people all over the world. We've covered a lot. The goals, the science, the strategies, the human side of it all. But what does it all actually mean? How did Operation Fishbill Well shape the Cold War? And for that matter, how did it shape the world we live in today? That's the question we're going to tackle in the final part of our deep dive. So we've spent all this time digging into Operation Fishbowl, the goals, the science, all the anxieties of the Cold War. Yeah. But it's not just some history lesson, is it? <laughs> not even close. Yeah. This document, it makes you think, even today, I mean, it shows you just how tangled up science and military strategy can get, especially when you're talking about nukes. It makes you wonder about the scientists back then if they ever felt like they were going too far, you know, uncovering things that maybe humans weren't meant to know. It's hard to say for sure, but you definitely get the sense of urgency reading the document. Like they were racing against the clock, maybe even racing against their own uh, conscience in a way. Yeah, yeah. They knew the Soviets were doing their own tests. Right. And there was this pressure, this feeling that they had to keep up. They yeah. couldn't afford to fall behind in this, well, this terrifying arms race. And all that pressure, all that fear, you're probably pushed them into some pretty dangerous territory, right? Like trying to figure out if high altitude detonations could be used to cripple enemy defenses. Oh, absolutely. And that brings up a whole bunch of ethical questions that are still relevant today. I mean, when does scientific progress become too dangerous? Who gets to decide what we should and shouldn't be researching? There are no easy answers. This document really drives home the point that there can be all these unintended consequences, especially with something as powerful and unpredictable as nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. This idea that a detonation in one part of the world could have ripple effects thousands of miles away, that's a pretty sobering thought. It really is. And it makes you wonder, did the people planning these tests really grasp what they were doing you know, on a global scale? Did they think about the long-term effects, the environment, people's health, international relations? Yeah. Or were they so focused on the Soviets, on that immediate threat, that they just didn't have the time or maybe even the will to look that far ahead? It's almost like they opened this Pandora's box of knowledge, and once it was open, there was no going back. That's a good way to put it. And you could argue that we're still dealing with the fallout from that today. The Cold War might be over, but the nuclear threat, it's still there. Yeah, for sure. And you could say it's even more complicated now, with more countries having nukes, new technologies emerging. It's a whole different ballgame. So all those things they were worrying about back then, the communication systems being vulnerable, the possibility of long-range disruptions, they haven't gone away, have they? Nope, not really. They've just morphed, taken on new forms. And this document, it's a powerful reminder of that. Mm -hmm. It shows us that the quest for knowledge, especially when it comes to powerful tech, can have huge consequences, consequences we might not even see coming. Yeah. It's a reminder that we need to be careful, think things through, maybe even be a little afraid as we keep pushing the boundaries of science and technology. It definitely gives you a lot to think about. What other Cold War secrets are still out there just waiting to be discovered? Mm -hmm. And what can we learn from that era, from all those mistakes and close calls yeah. that might help us deal with the problems we're facing today? Those are the questions we need to be asking. Operation Fish Below might seem like ancient history, but it has a lot to teach us about the world we live in right now. It reminds us that the choices we make, the technologies we create, the knowledge we seek, they all have the power to shape the future, for better or worse. Yeah. It's up to us to make sure we're shaping it for the better, not leading to our own destruction. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for taking this deep dive into Operation Fish Age Bull WL with me. We'll see you next time for another look into the past.